You know, what does it mean when you meet somebody who is really unusual and you learn about him? Well, let's find out. You know, the book of Proverbs, chapter 13, verse 1, says the following. It says, A wise son heeds his father's instruction, but a scoffer does not listen to rebuke. You know, I was a preacher's son, and there was a time when I did not listen to my father's correction. Well, today we meet somebody who also was a preacher's son, and his life certainly did not did not match the idea of who he was. And somebody got a hold of him. Somebody who is what I call an emphasis on the Lord. So let's listen to a man. His name is Brian Stiller. He is a wonderful man. And later in life, he tells us the truth about his early life and how God helped him to redeem who he was. Here's Brian Stiller. Where were you 30 years ago? And that's a good question to ask yourself any time that you're thinking about the past. Well, 30 years ago, I met a man who's a great man. His name is Brian Stiller, and he's with me here today. Brian, good to have you here. Welcome. Thank you, Rod. Let me ask you a question. A lot of people know you from a lot of places, and um, you're, of course, uh, the, the person who is part of the WEA, you have been in faith today. You have led Youth for Christ. You've done a lot of different things. But I want to go back to uh, the early years. Uh, you were born where? In a Western Canadian prairie province called Saskatchewan. Saskatchewan. Wow. So how many sisters or brothers do you have? Two brothers, two sisters. I was the youngest brother. So you're the youngest brother. The youngest brother. I, had a I have a sister younger. Wow. Now, as you grew up in that time, were your parents Christian or did they go to church? My father was a Pentecostal pastor. Uh, and I was born in a small town called Nakam. He was eventually elected as what we would call bishop or superintendent of this Pentecostal churches in Saskatchewan. So that was my, uh, that was, um, those were my formative years in the 40s and 50s in a, uh, so 40s and 50s, the years where your personality is developing and you're figuring all of that out. Now, just out of curiosity, a, a preacher's kid, um, when you encounter God in those times, when you, you're young and you, you begin to recognize who the Lord is, how does that affect you? Like, what did you ask yourself? Did you ask yourself, I, I really don't believe in this stuff. Who is God anyway? How did you come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ? Well, as with us all, it's transitional. You go from one moment to another. My earliest moment is loving the evening time when mom read us Bible stories. And that was a bit of a lever she had in keeping me to behave. Because if I didn't, I missed out that. And there was no better moment for me in the day than hearing you read Bible stories to us kids. Why so, was that? I loved the Bible stories. I, I, I just loved them. I, uh, there was nothing that uh, seemed in my memory as important as those, as those moments. I suppose it was, my mother was a great reader. She had good Bible stories to read. Stories I had heard many times, but I always wanted to hear them again as children do. And it was a family moment. And then I would hear dad preach. And a, a few weeks ago, I was in Saskatchewan to the, to the funeral of my lifelong buddy, Gordon Cresswell in Tisdale. And dad pastored there. And so I went into this older church. And I remember, cut, I remember on a Sunday evening service sitting up in the balcony. So I would have been maybe four or five years of age. 
And I came and I asked my mother afterwards, why is dad mad? And she said, why? Well, I said, he's shouting when he's preaching. So that was a, a, that was a, a moment of curiosity as to what the gospel was and how you did those kind of things like preaching. But those, those moments, those years of, uh, those formative years of, of um, spiritual interest, uh, mother put salt in the water for us to want more to hear in the stories of Jesus. When did you actually make the decision that Jesus is something that you're going to commit your life to? Well, it happened in high school. So we had moved to Saskatoon. And through my years, I, my sister now in, in remembering, she thinks I was ADD. I suppose my mother would, aff would affirm that. I was, I was a bit restless, curious. Uh, and I had, uh, I had difficulty in, in, with teachers when I was in my elementary school. Uh, and was, was, I think, problematic just because I was bored and restless. And got into got into trouble and was just a was a 13, 14 year old boy that was that was restless and doing silly things and breaking windows and smoking on the side and all the things that a pastor, a Pentecostal pastor's boy, of course, would never be caught doing. But then I spent a summer working on farms up a little place called Parkside. Came back and there was a friend of mine, his name was Lauren Ashton, and we were we would fish together and bike together and smoke together. And I was I was really uh, moving in in not a pleasant direction as a person. And our churches had a joint set of meetings with an evangelist from Vancouver. Her name was Bernice Gerard. And the Sunday night service was in the Tivoli Theater, and Lauren and I were there. And we had our black cat court cigarettes in our pockets. And Bernice preached, and I was under great conviction. But of course, my ego wouldn't allow me to show my hand as a stiller boy, because everybody assumed I was fine. We went to the washroom afterwards, and I took out my, my cigarettes, my black cat cork, and I broke them in half, and I threw them in the toilet. And of course, Lauren was annoyed that I would throw away such valuable uh, instruments of pleasure. And I said, Lauren, I got to follow Jesus. And I remember walking out and walking down 2nd Avenue, waiting for mom and dad to collect the car to drive home. And I knew I was changed. In fact, the other day, I'm, we're downsizing, Lily and I are downsizing, so I've got all this stuff to get rid of, and I came across a letter that my mother had written. And she had written a note that she had never sent to me. But I found them in her material when she passed away. And she wrote this letter. She said, Brian, I remember the Monday morning when you came down into the basement where I was washing clothes. And you said, Mom, I think I need to take more studies in music. And she asked me why. And, I, and it was my signal to her that I had turned my life to the Lord. And that was a transformative moment. That, that changed my life, changed the direction of my life, my attitudes, my, my how behaviors. Did that, so, so it, but, but how did that reflect in your life then? I think I was nicer. I was more focused. I was a better son, maybe a better brother. I had, I had growing interest in the things of the Lord. Uh, activities of church weren't in, weren't, I wasn't cynical or annoyed about it. I, I participated, got involved. Youth for Christ had come into town, and I got involved in the music par, part of Youth for Christ. And uh, there was a whole number of things. And the, the, the choice of friends, uh, camp meeting. We had a, we had a camp uh, on Lake Manitou, which was the saltiest lake in North America. I mean, only Pentecostals could, could have a camp at a saltwater lake and call it Living Waters Camp, right? I loved it. It was a place of, of special joy and of, of spiritual encounters. There are just a whole number of things that just unfolded. So that, that moment of, 
of new birth open new doors and I chose to walk through them. And of course, every door opens another door and you make choices and that one choice here leads to a whole number of people and events and insights. And that was the moment, that was the moment. So your life literally changed. Oh yeah, it was, it was. So when people talk about the new birth, uh, some it's, it's transitional, it's gradual, it's evolutionary. Mine was a moment in time. When I, when I, when the light came on, when the Lord came into my life and I had always loved Jesus. It was never that I was antagonistic. Everybody would say that, that knew me on the surface was, yeah. But I knew that inside there were some things that were desperately wrong that needed changing. And it was more than the things that needed changing, I needed changing. And that was the moment when the Spirit grasped me and said, you're going to be mine. And I said, I agree. And I was changed. So I understand the new, the new birth as a metaphor of encounter with Christ. I understand that. So God's changed your life. And suddenly this person that you heard preached is real to you. And uh, this makes some shifts in how you're doing things and how you're preparing things. And so my question is, what did you do for schooling? Where did you go to school after you finished high school? Well, that moment when I said to my mom, as by the letter she reminded me of that I read the other day, I, I decided to become serious about, about music because I thought music, music was an essential part of our Pentecostal experience and the larger Youth for Christ uh, community. So I, I, I became very disciplined in, in, in studying and preparing uh, in music and piano. And that led to certain opportunities and, and, and so forth. So let me stop you there because this is important. We're talking about music and we're going to pick that up in a minute. And I want you to tell us where that led you. And we'll talk about your wife and other things that have happened. But keep that in mind because as we continue to talk to Brian Stiller, keep this in mind that he is the head of WEA or well, he's the one of the principal people in WEA. And the rest of it will explain what WEA is uh, in the next uh, few minutes. But keep that in our hearts because God is talking to us now. The Bible Discovery Guide takes you through pages of the most important book that you will ever read. It is the Word of God. Through careful exploration and thoughtful insight, we uncover the truths presented in the Bible. For your sample copy, write to P.O. Box 150, Murraysville, Pennsylvania, 15668 -0150. That's Bible Discovery, P.O. Box 150, Murraysville, Pennsylvania, 15668-0150. In Canada, write to Bible Discovery, P.O. Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario, L9W 5G2. That's Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario, L9W 5G2. Or simply go to BibleDiscoveryTV.com. His life has changed. Things are different now. He came to know the Lord Jesus Christ. Brian Stiller is telling us what happened. He's into music. What happened, Brian? Well, music became a formative part of my, of my high school years. I went to Bible college afterwards, formed a quartet with T Terry Law, who some of you may know of. You sang in a quartet? sang in a quartet and we found somebody who could play the piano. I didn't want to play and sing. Found the woman who I eventually married, Lily. We developed a quartet. Completed a Bible college. I realized I needed more education, so I went to university. Came to the University of Toronto. Started with Youth for Christ eventually. And during those early years, I started music teams across Canada and globally. Again, out of my music interest and experience. But I realized we needed to have contemporary music teams 
So we eventually did some kind of uh, Peter, Paul, and Mary stuff, and then we did some Chicago band stuff. We moved a little further into the rock idiom, but we prepared these teams, and because of my interest in music, I understood that. In the developing of that, it led me to eventually become president of Youth for Christ Canada and work on the issue of strategy of youth ministry because now we we're in a counterculture in the late 60s. What year was that, the late 60s? Late 60s. So you have the counterculture moving up from San Francisco. You have the Jesus movement, all those dynamics. Secularism becomes more dominant in high school so that our ministry in high school changes. We have to f figure out how we relate to young people who don't who are who are curious to why Jesus is even on a Christmas card? Like why they are there is such a a, 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 a dearth of understanding of, of the gospel. So that world was changing. We had to create our, a new strategy for ministry with with uh, with high school youth. So that became the next sector of my life. So this the whole youth for Christ thing was very very uh, good for you in terms of growing you into the next level. Then what happened? Well, but, but the important thing for me at that point, see, again, I, I go back to my earlier years, my aspiration was to be a great evangelist. Because you see, on the hierarchy of, our, of my youth, evangelists, great preachers, were at the top of the picking order. And that's what I aspired to do. My, my alpha male, highly egoed young boy's spirit and vision catapulted me into that role because that was the most significant role that one could play. In Youth for Christ, I realized I wasn't a bad preacher, but I was a better leader. And so I, I recognized then that I had the capacity to envision and to recruit and build ministry that nurtured organization. So that's what, that's what Youth for Christ taught me. And I finished that in 83. I knew I had finished, <laughs> I had kind of burned myself out there. I was tired. It was time for me to move on. And that's when I came into the Evangelical Fellowship, which is the Canadian Evangelical Alliance. It was in somebody's third drawer. It, was, it had been started years before by my mentor, Harry Fought. And uh, I had uh, been involved in it, but it was a, an ineffectual organization at that point. And we, I was going to I was going to a church in, or considering going to a church in, in Vancouver, uh, First Assembly. I was thinking about it, spent some time up here in Blue Mountain, uh, reflecting for a few days. And out of Nehemiah, I wrote in my notes, find a broken wall. Find a broken wall no one cares about. Find a broken wall people make fun of. But whatever you do, find a broken wall. And that's when EFC came. And I, over the next number of years, I developed a national voice for evangelicals. But I recognized out of my out of my childhood, my this this you know God's will isn't from isn't a straight line from from A to Z or Z. It's a zigzag, and so in my zigzag, I'm discovering my my gifts. Yeah, you're going to be having Jim Cantlin on here in a moment, and I remember when Jim and Kathy and Lily and I and two others were in an Italian restaurant downtown Toronto when this other person began to talk to me about gifting. And that changed my life, where I understood the things that I aspired to be. I had other giftings that were prime for God to use, and I needed to recognize it, embrace it, and feel comfortable with it. That was a, that was a critical moment. That's, that Saturday night with the six of us down on King Street in that Italian restaurant was a moment when God spoke into, spoke into my life an understanding of who I was and who he had made me to be, and who he called me to affirm and to embellish. And that was another critical moment in my life. So that brings you to the place where Evangelical Fellowship of Canada, now some other things happened and it changed again. You went somewhere else. Well, so it's over the next 16 years, built a national voice, a magazine, a, a, a weekly television show, and creating a Canadian voice for evangelical believers because there was such a tinny voice coming out of the U.S., out of evangelicals that, that worked in the U.S. but didn't work in Canada. We had to develop a voice there. What was the difference? Uh, Canadians are, are... The evangelical size in the U.S. gives it position to influence uh, the culture. We are a very small group in Canada, and we simply are less... We are more effacing... That's a Canadian way. 
And so our attempt, and we're a Catholic country, Canada, primarily 47% Catholic. And so our attempt here to be a voice for the gospel had to find various ways than other than what how the U.S. operated. That's what we had to do in Canada. And so that I did that for a number of years. But then the oldest school in uh, Bible college and seminary in Canada went bankrupt in 1995. And I was called in to, to do a rescue plan. And I, I knew, a, I knew a bit about that then. And I, and over the next number of years, we turned it into a university, got out of, out of debt and, uh, uh, bought a new campus. That was actually a miracle. I, I witnessed that. <laughs> that was absolutely stunning how you pulled that out. So, the question now is, what is the WEA and how did you get involved with that? The World Evangelical, there are three world Christian communities uh, out of the uh, 2.4 billion. Half is Roman Catholic. The, uh, 500 million would be the World Council of Churches, which includes 300 million of Orthodox and the World Evangelical Alliance, which uh, serves 650 million Christians. So evangelicals are about 25% of the world Christian community. WEA then is one of the three global voices. I got involved back in the 80s when it was a fairly ineffectual organization crumbling. And so I got involved just uh, because I was directing the Canadian Alliance. I got involved with the world body and over the years, had some involvement. When I went to Tyndale, my life was so absorbed by that experience and those responsibilities that I, I withdrew. When I finished- That was the Bible school, right. Go that's ahead. right. So when I, when I finished Tyndale University in, uh, in, in 2011, I was invited to come as global ambassador for the World Evangelical Alliance. And so for the last 12 years, I've been, I'm, the, I'm the old white-haired guy that bumps around the world encouraging younger leaders. The global ambassador. Yeah. That is excellent. Now, you've been to the Ukraine. We've talked about the Ukraine a yes. couple of times. What's going on? Well, it's a, it's a bit of a stalemate today. We, we don't know as we talk in, the, in, in, in May of 2023, we don't know what the offensive will be uh, on the eastern and southern front. Uh, those are the unknowns. Uh, but you know that... Uh, Resolved in the hearts of Ukrainians is a commitment to never give up. Uh, since 91, there's, there's about 9,000 evangelical congregations in Ukraine. There's been 9,000. 9, a uh, number of schools, uh, some brilliant uh, parachurch ministries and missions. Uh, they're very entrepreneurial. And the, and the breakout of the spirit in that land is, is remarkable to, to, to observe. I, I love the country. I love the people. I love their borscht. And I, I'm simply astounded by their determination and by their resilience in, in worship and in mission and in collaboration with others. So it's, it's a, it's a remarkable moment. I think that as this finds some kind of resolution, and it would be foolish for me to speculate on how it'll be resolved, the, the, the ultimate impact for the, for the global church will be a strong Ukrainian witness that will, will emerge out of these very, very difficult times. So the church then will survive whatever happens in Ukraine. It will come out, according to what you say, as a strong witness of what it means to serve God, what it means to live for God in the midst of war. Yes. And when, when you're, when you're, if you're a pastor, if your congregation has been dispersed or your building bombed, or maybe you're living in the center in towards Kiev or out towards Lviv on the, on the, on the Western front, uh, war may not be breaking in on your territory, but you do have brothers and husbands and sisters and family who have who are on the military front who have been killed so you you are all and your enterprise is of course uh, in many ways demolished because of war uh, so you're all affected by by the war but what you're doing you're 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 living you're living on the edge of hatred because the people that you trusted uh, I was there just before the war and I asked everybody, will Russia attack? No. Everybody said they never would. Those are our uncles. Those are our friends. Those are our colleagues. We, we holiday together. We, we have family. It would never happen. When it happened, of course, 
they didn't believe it. But when the when it finally dawned on them, what it does, it brews hatred. Because now the people you trusted are attacking you. And those that are attacking you are, are living with a story that is not true. And you can't even talk to them because there's no, there's no ability on their part to even listen to your story. So this breeds an enormous division. So in the Slavic world, you're going to end up with this, with this, uh, with this division. And so the, the question that I ask is, how will the gospel speak into your heart as a Ukrainian, which gives you love for others who up to now, the culture inspires you to hate? It's, and, and from that, as, as we know, Christians coming out of the, the second, the first and second world war, the enormous lessons that are, that have been learned, uh, there will be lessons learned that will again speak its way into the other areas, other countries like Sudan and Ethiopia and, and Myanmar, places where there is, there is civil war and internal antagonism. So again, out of these difficult moments, our trust is the spirit will bring an understanding and insight and an inclination towards peace and reconciliation that was never there before. A program experience delivering what God is saying to the human race today. Reading the Bible from cover to cover, we learn how God spoke to the people in the past, speaks about the future, and shows us how to react and respond to the difficulties and discovering of our lives today. Bible Discovery TV is a program hosted by the Hembry family as they uncover the meaning of God's message to planet Earth. To discover the meaning of God's Word and how the Lord is speaking to us today, visit Bible Discovery TV at BibleDiscoveryTV.com. That's BibleDiscoveryTV.com. You know, it's interesting when you hear a story like that and listen to what's going on and how he has been able to capture everything in the end. It reminds me of what Ecclesiastes said, written by the wisest man who ever lived. And he wrote thinking, what is man without God? But then at the end of the chapter, he says the following. Verse 13 of chapter 12, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God, keep his commandments, for this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether the thing is good or whether the thing is evil. You know, Brian Stiller has learned that God is serious about this earth and he's serious about reaching people and helping people. And today, if you're one of those people who need God, come to know the Lord today and ask him to take over your life because he will do a better job than anything or anybody else. He is the one who created us and he is the one who can help us understand why we are even on this earth. So today, Come to Jesus Christ and pray, Lord, help me now.